Welcome to our latest webinar for corporates. In this series, we'll be examining recent events and looking ahead at what might be in store for financial markets and the economy. Welcome everybody to this morning's webinar, um, the second to last webinar of this year. The uh, next one in early December will contain a lot of our views around what's happened over the course of this year and a look forward to the year ahead. But there's a lot to digest in terms of what's happened over the course of the last month since the, uh, the previous webinar. So let's dive straight into that and uh, look at my first slide. And that is just going to outline the contents of my presentation before I hand over to Piers. So we're going to look again at the global recovery. We've had some updated forecasts. So what do they show? Do they show supply disruptions hurting the growth outlook? We'll then look at inflation risks. And I think we've had some further decisive evidence that inflation risks are clearly more medium term than short term. And we'll then look at how that may be affecting central banks' decision making before looking back at the UK budget. I think there were some significant changes, some significant alterations as far as the outlook for uh, the UK's public finances, as well as how we're going to fund those public finance commitments. And, uh, and so that could have a material impact on the performance of the UK economy going into 2022 before turning our attention to the FX markets and, and, uh, and what's happening there. Uh, then we'll, we'll uh, look at the disclaimer and, uh, and then uh, I'll hand you over to Piers. So moving on to the next slide in the global recovery. Um, undoubtedly, I think that the supply disruptions are potentially more significant than the latest set of IMF forecasts would indicate. I think they've taken away a lot of the potential upside risks to the growth outlook for 2022. And there's still a potential for the last couple of months of this year uh, to be materially negatively affected uh, by the increase in prices and supply chain disruption. You know, where is this likely to be most keenly felt? Well, in the likes of the US and UK economies, I think um, certainly there is a significant consumption period here that could be disrupted by this supply chain or by these ongoing supply chain issues. Um, whereas in Euroland, I think they've they've reached their their trough as far as their growth risks are concerned. And, and if anything, there might be some small upside risks to Euroland growth going into the, the end of this year and the early stage of 2022. One other thing to note is that we are seeing some uh, downward revisions to the growth numbers for parts of Asia. I think some of that is down to the resurgence of COVID in a number of these economies and the need for additional restrictions or even lockdown measures. So the global recovery um, has taken a little bit of a knock, but less so uh, of a knock than perhaps the supply chain disruption uh, may uh, eventually um, lead to. So I think there are downside risks. I highlight those downside risks to the global economy going into 2022. So moving forward onto the next slide and looking at inflation risks, this chart is the Commodity Research Bureau's uh, index of commodities. So it's like a basket of commodities. And it shows that the aggregated uh, price increases have continued to trend higher. So we're, we've hit a fresh six-year high at the end of October. Yes, we've come off a little bit from that. But it does demonstrate that there's a, a, an ongoing creep into other commodity prices, whereas we'd seen it in uh, areas of construction previously. We're now seeing it in the precious and non-precious metals. Um, so there are, there are undoubtedly um, some inflation risks that are creeping into other sectors. And, and the high-tech sector is one that's been flagged to us recently, where the production of semiconductors has been interrupted. Um, the price of the materials going into those semiconductors are increasing. And actually, a lot of the producers are finding it difficult to pass on those price rises swiftly enough to prevent them from, from making a loss. So it has seen a sizable interruption in the supply chain for these. So there's a chip shortage more generally, uh, and that will potentially lead to price rises across things like automotive um, and, of course, um, into computers, both for uh, commercial um, and also personal uh, business. 
I think the concerns about supply chain disruption are continuing to manifest themselves because what we're seeing is clearly demand outstripping supply. And why is this happening? Well, we've seen a very sizable recovery in emerging market economies, particularly those in Southeast Asia. Um, but, and the, the, the biggest of those is the Chinese economy. So the, the big improvement in the Chinese economy has led to that supply demand imbalance. And, and that, I think, will lead to further price rises into the, the end of this year and into the first part of 2022. And we're seeing UK corporates report more widespread labour and supply chain shortages. And, and that, I think, will eventually feed through into higher prices. Although at the moment, what it's leading to is actually some further pressure on profit margins. So you're seeing a, a contraction in profit margins because input prices have been rising far faster than output prices. So that um, will lead to a, a, an element of catch up as we head into 2022, in my opinion. Moving on to the next slide and, and central banks. Well, it do, this slide doesn't look particularly interesting, but uh, that just means that we haven't seen any major developed economies raising interest rates as yet. But we've certainly seen a sizable number of developing economies raising interest rates. Those in Latin America and also in Eastern Europe have been leading the charge on this. Uh, but we've even seen uh, interest rate hikes in, in, in other economies in Africa and such like. So we, we need to be mindful of that because, of course, emerging economies now uh, control more than 50% of global GDP. Moreover, we need to be mindful of that because of the reasons that are being stated for those, those interest rate hikes, which is that they are worried about the longevity of inflation. And it's noteworthy that we've seen pressure on, on some countries where they haven't gotten to grips with the in, inflation increases. So the likes of Turkey has seen its currency hitting new highs. Whilst it's not likely that we're going to see significant interest rate increases out of the US over the next year or so, if any at all, um, there is more of a question mark over the UK. And, and we've got the UK's Bank of England meeting tomorrow, and the market is pretty evenly split, and economists and forecasters are pretty evenly split over whether there will be a, a hike or not. Now, I think that the UK economy can't really withstand any additional pressure being applied to it. And we've already seen that the government have announced that they will be raising taxes for businesses and individuals such that, and, and there's a, a slide on this in a second, but, um, but such that if we were to then compound that with a, a rise in interest rates, that would cause some significant problems for both businesses and individuals, particularly individuals at the lower end of the income spectrum. It could also lead to further wage inflation demands. And, um, uh, and I certainly think that at this juncture, given that the UK has not yet recouped all of its lost economic output, it would be a mistake for the central bank to raise interest rates. Perhaps when, when we're, we're through 2021 and into the early part of 2022, there will be more justification for those increases. Um, but we'll, we'll wait and see on that. I think the one economy that has um, has sailed through this period, not really altering its its projections for when it will start to tighten monetary policy, is the uh, European economy. The Euroland economy has uh, seen the European Central Bank say, look, we're not going to do anything. Um, we don't think that it's necessary. We think the inflation is temporary. And actually, even if it isn't, we've actually suffered from a prolonged period where inflation has been um, uh, too low over a significant and sustained period of time. So they, they don't feel the need to alter their monetary policy projections. And I think that even with the US, they probably won't be raising interest rates until very late into 2022 or early 2023. So we'll move on to the next slide and, and, and look at that, um, that higher tax position. So this is from the Office for Budget Responsibilities October uh, Economic and Fiscal Outlook report that accompanied the Chancellor's budget only a couple of weeks ago. And what it demonstrate is the UK going to multi-decade highs in terms of the tax burden. Now, that is to in order to uh, pay for the additional spending that's been put in situ. So, actually, the fiscal environment remains expansionary. But I think there is a risk 
on both consumer spending and business investment to the downside that if this tax burden is accompanied with those interest rate increases that are currently projected by the markets, then that could uh, create a hostile environment for additional investment or spending. And consequently, I think we need to be uh, mindful and wary of the downside risks to the UK economy that could come about from this. I don't think that the additional spending that we're seeing um, with regard to the areas that the government have prioritised, those being things like healthcare and education, are going to create significant increases in uh, GDP, even though the overall fiscal environment remains expansionary. And it's slightly less expansionary than it was because spending for all of those um, COVID recovery requirements has been slightly less than was previously anticipated. So overall, the UK budget, the big takeaway that I uh, uh, saw from it is higher taxes to pay for the increases in spending, but the increases in spending are marginally lower than was were previously predicted at the time of the March 21 forecast. So if we then wrap all of this up and say, what does this mean for the um, uh, foreign exchange market? It's this next slide shows that the, the forecasts haven't really changed that much. You know, the euro has been under pressure. I actually think the euro, because I, as I've mentioned previously, um, the performance of the European economy might be the one, it might be the one economy that we actually outperforms its expectations. We could see that rising into the end of the year. I'm less convinced about sterling and its ability to uh, make significant additional headway, even though the forecast suggests it's going up into the high 130s and possibly low 140s over the course of the next three or four months. I'm less convinced by that. And I think where we'll see that manifest itself is indeed in sterling euro, where I'd expect to see some weakness there heading into the end of the year. We recently um, topped 119 briefly in sterling euro, but we didn't remain there very long. And so watch out for that. It could be heading lower and significantly below recent levels that we've seen. Um, it's also worthwhile noting that we, we are seeing that those pressures still exerting themselves on Latin American currencies and on other emerging market currencies. And so they're going to have to be very vigilant in terms of monetary policy tightening to deal with any inflationary impacts that, that they're seeing. Um, otherwise, their currencies could come un, under further speculative attack heading into the end of the year. And I think what we're, we're really likely to see is more volatility, or more uncertainty uh, as far as currency rates heading into the end of the year. So just, just watch out for that and how that will play out in terms of where the, uh, the currency rates finish for the year, because that may give us a good steer about how they're going to perform into 2022. The one other thing I would, I would stress is that I'm not convinced that there is that much more dollar upside as far as um, the euro is concerned and, and, and certainly against um, sterling. But we may see the dollar weaken um, against other currencies and potentially other emerging market currencies if there is a sustained improvement in risk appetite like we've seen over recent weeks. So just watch out for that because the dollar might be at a turning point here as well, although um, I'd certainly be very interested to hear what Piers has to say uh, with regard to that. So just before I hand over to Piers, I'm going to leave you with my disclaimer, um, which is this next slide. Um, hopefully that has been interesting. Hopefully that's, um, that's fed through into some questions and we look forward to hearing those questions at the end of the presentation. But Piers, you've heard the fundamentals. Now, what do the technicals look like? Well, thanks for that, Neil. Fascinating stuff as ever. And uh, I'll come to Euro Sterling and Sterling, but I, th I think we might agree on the, the Sterling Euro. So that's a bit worrying when we agree. So I'm going to look at the charts and look at the markets in a different way to Neil. Neil looks at all the information and all processes, all that, and what's going on with central banks and things like that. I just look at the price action and feel that when everyone's traded and put their bets on, let's see what they feel is going to happen with the rate. So we move to the next slide. Well, the first slide in my presentation. This is the S&P index, and it's a monthly chart. And I had this on last month, warning of the bearish outside session. So two months ago, the whole market collapsed. You opened at the 
nearly the high, you closed at the low, and it wiped out the previous month. So I was very negative on the S&P, and I just thought it was the whole dollar move that we were seeing the dollar strength, and I thought equity markets would fall down. And I was wrong because I had a stop area where you take 50% of the preceding month, and that's that black dotted line, and the market broke up through there. So the market is back on for let's test this higher. But we have the Fed meeting over the next couple of days, and it'll be interesting to see what they say and do regarding tapering and the interest rates. So I think it'll be interesting to see if this stays up, because if we get a move up, let's say, in the S&P towards 447, 4750, that could be quite a significant event on the dollar side. Whereas before we were expecting people to really buy into the dollar because the equity is coming down, maybe it won't be such a, a big fall on the dollar as I was expecting. So if we move to the next slide and we look at the first currency related one, this is the dollar index. Now, the dollar index is controlling what's happening with the dollar very clearly. Now, this is the monthly chart. Last month, I had the weekly chart as well, pointing out this is just stalling at the 38.2% retracement. So if we look at the collapse down from 2020 to 2021. You then got a rally back up through 21, and it's stalling at the 38.2%. It's also what we call the rule of polarity. It was where support used to be, and it's now where resistance is. So for an, another bout of dollar strength, if you get above 94.66 on a monthly close, then I think you see the next dollar strength up towards 96.97. Now, I think that'd be quite a strong move if it comes. So you really have to keep an eye on that 38.2, just to keep an eye on where is the dollar going to go long term. Is it going to back off there and then weaken off, or is it going to break through there? So that's the real key level to watch. Below 9260, 70 area would be a blow to the bulls. But while any monthly close below 9130 is really where I think you'd give up that this was going to try and strengthen and the dollar bears would be back in control. So those are the key levels to watch on the dollar index. Keep watching that 38.2. On the next slide, we're going to look at euro dollar. Now, euro dollar, again, we can look quite nicely at the Fibonacci retracements. We take the low to the high of the move up from 2020. And we'll see that as we came back into 2021, initially there was some support at the 38.2, which was 116.95. But look, both these months, it's capped by 116.95. So on euro dollar, it's quite simple. We're going to watch 116.95. Below 116.95, then the, the risk is euro dollar goes lower down towards the 113. Above 116.95, that risk is gone and it opens up the move towards 117.25. And I think a lot of these things are going to get sorted out this week once we've had the central bank meeting. Once the Fed's met, I think you'll start to get the move. So it's really important to watch what happens on Thursday night. Now, this is where Neil tells me it's not Thursday night. But um, on the next slide, we're going to look at sterling, start to look at sterling. And we'll look at that by the sterling index. Now, on this chart, I have a monthly chart, and it's the price action of sterling from 2014, 2015. And we can see the big collapse on the start of the chart from 2015 down into 2016. So after Brexit, the market has been slightly going upwards in a, what we call a rising channel, those two black lines going across the chart. It goes to the bottom, to the top, to the bottom, to the top. Now, this last time, it went from the bottom, and it hasn't quite got to the top. So that, that's a bit of a concern. So that's one thing. Why haven't we gone to the top of the channel? So that's a bit worrying for Stern. The other thing we have is if you look at the pink dotted line going down from left to right, that's the trend line. So the price is actually broken above the trend line. It retests the trend line, went higher. So you would expect a bit further move higher on sterling index. But just at this moment, it seems to be struggling. And we can see that for the last few months in those two black lines, all it's done is gone sideways, really, between 65 and a quarter 
and 63 and a half. Now, as you're getting near the 63 and a half, you might get a short term burst up on sterling, but it really needs to get above 65 and a quarter on the sterling index to start thinking about the strongest sterling. So at the moment, maybe a bit of a short term bounce on sterling, but then medium term is going to struggle, I think, when it gets towards 65 and a quarter, above 65 and a quarter, then we can be more positive on it. But at the moment, Short term, maybe a bit of sterling strength, followed by sterling weakness, maybe into the end of the year, like Neil's saying. So if we look at the next slide, we get to sterling dollar. Sterling dollar, we're going to follow the same rules. It's all quite nice and easy. So you had 2020, we had the low down there and the rally starting back off the 120.76 area. Where did that rally go up to? It went to 142.37. Then the market started to go back down. And what's it done? It's just traded the Fibonacci retracements on the monthly chart. So you can see that 137.27 held it monthly for a few months. Then it broke below it and it came down to the 38.2, which is 134.11. So as we can see for the last couple of months, when it's gone back up to 137.27, that sort of area has been resistance and sterling dollars been sold off. And the support has been 134.11. So it gives you two nice areas to watch this month. If you start to see price above the 137.27, then whatever gets announced by the Fed, maybe that's being taken as dollar negative and we'll start to see cable, uh, cable go higher. But if we see a move below 134.10, then that's a worry especially if you get a monthly close below 134.10, because that could open up 131 and a half and potentially right down to that 129 area if sterling is weakening and the dollar strengthening. So it's really one to keep an eye on. I said last month on this call that the easy time is over for looking at FX markets, which we've had for the last few years, but it's been quite easy. Well, it's not been easy, but it's been easier than it is now. Because what you have now is you have our rates going to change? Is tapering going to end? Do people want to go back into the dollar? Do they not? Is sterling strengthening? There's a lot of things going on. So just simplify it for the moment 134 against 137 and a quarter. Keep an eye on them and see how that closes into the month end. Or even if you get a weekly close outside those, that will be a quicker key, I feel. The next slide we have is euro sterling. And on euro sterling, this is the, the same sort of chart we had on the quarterly chart. This is euro sterling going back from 2015. And if we look at the rally, and the reason we have that high, which I've chosen, is because it was the highest close. So I didn't take the first spike. I'm not a very big fan of taking spike action because it's where people were wrong. The people who are buying up above at the top of that spike regretted it really quickly. So I prefer taking the highest close, and we've taken the highest close there. When you look at the moves back down, they've stopped at the 38.2, which is at 84.01. So if you get my daily and weekly charts, at the beginning of last week, we're at 84.01, and I said risk reward changes here, and look for a move back higher off the 84.01. And it is because of this as well, the 38.2%. So you should see a bit of a rally here but it has broken the trend line. So you would expect that as price goes back up, then longer term is going to start to struggle as it gets towards the 87 or that trend line area. So if sterling does have a good run off this 84, maybe up to 86.70, uh, maybe up to 88.89, if you're going to retest that, that trend line, which it broke. But where does sterling change to the downside? If it gets below that 84, especially on a monthly close, that's when you will see, I feel, a lot of selling of euro sterling and a strong move lower. So a move higher in sterling euro, if you're looking for that, you need to get above that 8401, uh, uh, below that 8401 in euro sterling to get a move higher in sterling euro. And uh, that, I think, concludes my slides, but I'd like to appreciate that we've covered a lot of ground on the webinar. 
There's some time for questions afterwards. But if you have any questions on my charts or the presentation in general, please just contact your NatWest FX salesperson and they can get in contact with me on your behalf on any questions you have. Hopefully that's been interesting. We look forward to seeing you on the next call, which I believe is scheduled for December the uh, is it December the eighth? Yes, it is December the eighth. So we look forward to to seeing you on December the eighth, peers. We look forward to welcoming you back for a look back at the year and a look ahead to twenty twenty two. Thanks for joining. Okay. Thanks very much for listening to the webinar. We hope you found it informative. The next in the series will be available shortly.